Hi, Johan. Are you there? Yes. Yes, uh, Johan. I'll uh, I give you a, just a very, very, very brief introduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Johan will, will uh, give us uh, some, uh, some tasks about uh, football fitness uh, in uh, Swedish elite football. Uh, I'll let you speak as soon as possible. Hi, <laughs> Johan. Okay, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, event. Uh, I will share with you what uh, Carlo just said, the football fitness in an elite football setting, which is currently Sweden. Uh, you find my details uh, on the first page and also on the last page, if you want to contact me in the meantime. Um, as a fitness coach, uh, it's important to take football as a starting point. So the game is the reference and uh, we'll, be, we'll be listening for a while. So you will just be uh, viewing a, a few clips on uh, the team that I used to work for, AIK, which is the case that I'm going to present. Uh, so you're going to look for some uh, football actions in all different phases of the game, but mostly attacking. Boitom, Montobasi. Ja, fin löpning. Hena Goitom försöker ta ner den där bollen. Bra gjort av David. Så här fort gick det. Snabbt slagen frispark. Väldigt bra. Svala på sån. Det är smäll i det här läget. Ska i låret kan kännas rätt ordentligt. Goitom håller sig i av Romne. Goitom och Salomonsson i ryggen. Två spelare nu. Läcker boll föredömligt. Så, so, as you could see... Försökte uh, Lindqvist där. It was uh, a lot of clips in the different phases of, of the game. And that's what unites us. Uh, on the theory level, football is objective. It's got the same rules, same principles, uh, and no cultural differences. But what I will present today will be on the level of application, where different external factors, uh, different cultures, different experience and opinions uh, will apply. And then it's... Uh, also the, the fact and the art of coaching that will be uh, a factor in this matter. So as a challenge for you, I will present uh, on the application level and you will have to theorize uh, and then think about how can I apply maybe one or two things in my environment. Um, <clears throat> and I will discuss mostly about implementing and monitoring the uh, strategies within the team on a, on a weekly level. So, uh, beginning though from the, the reference with the football uh, and with the objective reference, trying to look at football as a whole. How has football developed? Well, this study from Bonds shows uh, that it's uh, evolving with a lot of actions, especially explosive actions is increasing um, throughout football. So you could say that the football players nowadays are more Formula One cars than uh, just ordinary cars. We could see this from our own stats, uh, from the game stats that we collected. Uh, this is the game data from three seasons and it's just on, on the team level. And we can conclude that it was, yes, it is the high uh, intensive actions and explosive actions that are increasing, uh, but the total distance is not increasing uh, as much and, and is maybe more or less unaffected. So we can conclude it's not about who can run the most, but most correct. Uh, and given this, uh, individual player report. Uh, it's the sprints that you can see from Christopher, which is 59. And then uh, it's summed up in high intensive movement and sprint movement. That's where the real uh, essence uh, of the game is and maybe where uh, 
the player has struggling to to recover from. But what what uh, a lot of studies uh, suggest. So this is from the Italian Serie A. Technical performance during elite soccer matches, uh, effect of fatigue and, comp and competitive level. This is from the Swedish league. And this is from the German Bundesliga. What they all conclude is that often team losing runs more and top teams run more in attacking uh, play. So there's no correlation between running more and, and uh, get a better result. So that's important to have as a reference for, for us as a fitness coach. So the, the, <clears throat> the, the numbers from Christopher is saying, what does the game cost for him? It doesn't necessarily say that if he runs 74 sprints, he's going to do a better performance. So this is, of course, nothing new. <clears throat> so again, but it's not, uh, not about who can run the most, but most correct. This is a clip from Italy. Uh, Italy defending in Euros 2016, defending prevention of build-up. And again, who can run the most correct? Uh, maybe uh, more a precise way of developing football fitness. As Bradley shows on his study, um, let's go and pause the clip, that the different playing formations will also have an effect on what uh, the demands are on your players. So depending, depending on what strategies you use in your playing style, you will also have different demands on your players. So, if we take the game as a starting point, then we need to get some sort of uh, evaluation of how much do each player do each game. And this is just an overview from one of our games where we can look at the game demands from individual players provided by Karen Higo and the track app data. And that creates the reference for us in how, uh, what are the demands on the game and then we should, should prepare the players for. On the other so uh, side, there are also a lot of injuries in football. This is just an overview of the uh, injuries in uh, English, English Premier League uh, from 2016 and 17, where you can see the wage bill comes up to quite an astonishing amount. So injuries affect team performance negatively in professional football, which uh, a study by Football Research Group and Jan Ekstan and, and uh, Martin Heglund concluded. So it's important uh, to keep the players on the pitch. So the two main objectives for, for the football fitness, which I will talk about uh, in, in a little bit deeper, is strategies to keep the players on the pitch, which is exemplified on the picture, uh, where uh, one of the opponents is it's, uh, more or less hugging our captain and develop the player's ability to make better and more football actions during, uh, according to the playing style and the role of the player every game of the year. And this is highlighted by uh, Tarek El Yunusi, the Norwegian rubber ball, I call him, uh, whose amount of rec uh, recovering from action to action is uh, quite remarkable. <coughs> It's not often that you do three, uh, three slide cycles uh, as the next, next action between, uh, between the actions. <clears throat> so if Tare can do one action, uh, X, today, and tomorrow he's going to uh, do a more explosive action. And then the objective is also that he can recover uh, and do the amount of actions a lot quicker. So the objective one, availability. Okay, so where's the, what's the cutoff? What's, what's the objective? What's the aim? Of course, we want everyone to be on the pitch. Well, if we look at uh, the data again from the Football Research Group, you can see that uh, you can have a benchmark or they recommend a benchmark for 90%. So we have the objective of having 90% or more available uh, to... Um, 
to play the games. Objective number two is to perform a st uh, stabilization, to be uh, stable in the performance throughout the whole season. So comparing football to track and field is quite a difference. We want to uh, maintain a long performance stabilization, whereas maybe a track and field athlete maybe want to go um, just for one single event, which might be the Olympics. So we want to keep our fitness level and our freshness level, so our potential fitness uh, as high as possible. And we want, him, want these to tag along on the whole way. So the accumulation of fatigue, especially on game day, is something that we want to avoid. And we want to try to uh, increase the ceiling as we go. So what then are the four most important factors to keep the players fit and on the pitch? Well, we can again go back to the um, research from the Football Research Group uh, and the Jan Ekstrand Group, which has concluded that if you manage player load, so you need to, be, uh, meet, need to make players ready for the game, external load, which is the work that they, they do, and the internal load, which is the reaction on, uh, on the work, which has been uh, good uh, debated already uh, within these talks. <clears throat> the well-being of players. Uh, how can you assess the well-being of players? Uh, and as Samuel just uh, talked about, the mental fatigue part, maybe. The leadership style of the, of the coaches. And then internal communication. So the importance is how do we connect all these different stakeholders, uh, which is the player, the coach, the fitness coach, and... Um, the, the physio on the bottom. <clears throat> so, the performance strategies that we choose, okay, so based on the, that objective reference, so uh, the performance strategies that we choose on the application level <clears throat> is that we need to manage our, our, um, our uh, uh, player load uh, in terms of periodization. We need to have some sort of monitoring uh, system or self-assessment uh, in order to know what we're doing. <clears throat> we might have to do some sort of fitness test, which is not included here, um, to say, say where, where are we right now uh, to, to be able to evaluate. And <clears throat> I will take you a little bit down to the prehab, pre-activation, the prep and the prep actions and the individualizing load and extra training. <clears throat> and also the strength training. So starting on the team uh, periodization, the principles of periodization. Uh, every week, as I told you, I will be discussing most on a, on a week, weekly basis, which is a microcycle. Uh, and then the microcycle repeats itself uh, for X amount of uh, uh, weeks a year. So in the recovery phase, we have the game and we have match day plus one and match day plus two. And in our case, we have chosen two different strategies, either to have a recovery, recovery session on match day plus one and then match day plus two off. Or we have a match day plus one off and um, we have training on match day plus two. But it's recovery phase in both uh, different alternatives. And there's plus and minuses with these both strategies, which is affected mostly depending on where the games are and if it's a uh, away game and also um, how late do we, do we travel and so forth. Um, so uh, there's two, two uh, strengths and weaknesses with, with both of them. And there's, uh, there's many more uh, that you can think of maybe. But the first scenario, the, the plus is, of course, that you can get direct feedback of the game. You can get a high load session for the subs. And you can also box the game and focus on the next for the first uh, option. And you can get uh, ahead to, to see, uh, see the players quite early and to get rid of maybe some niggles that you uh, weren't aware of after the game. It's hard to fit in a high load session if there's five days less, uh, uh, five days between games, though. 
In the second option, there's more time to do post analysis, to post game analysis, because you don't see the other players, uh, see the players from from uh, another day. Uh, better recovery if late arrival, uh, and it's suitable, more suitable if the week has less than five days between games. <clears throat> Minus is though is later feedback of the next game and hard to do high load session for the subs, and it's risk for a long week till next game. The pre-game phase, uh, the two trainings closest to the next game, will be more tactical. And that's uh, depending on uh, the style of play that we play and also the style of play of the opponents. That leaves us with an overload phase or a uh, acquisition phase in the middle of the week where we can do uh, our overload. And it's structured <coughs> containing uh, strategies for uh, football conditioning and also strength. So it consists mainly of uh, two sessions on the first day where it's a football session and a strength session and then it's a football conditioning session on the second day. <clears throat> on the conditioning games, uh, or football conditioning day, we will have uh, games between uh, 11 v 11 to 8 v 8 or down to 4v4 to 3v3 during these two acquisition days. Uh, we will supplement that with uh, high-speed running or mechanical work running, uh, as you can see from examples uh, here shown by uh, hit signs, which will be uh, talked about a little bit later from Paul, so I won't go into that. <clears throat> so depending on what strategy that we choose, uh, if we have a game recovery day, day off, uh, as in this case, then the week will, uh, will look at as follows between uh, the games, depending on how many days they're between. So we will have the recovery phase, we will have the tactical uh, game preparatory phase, and we will have the conditioning phase. And this puzzle uh, helps us to be uh, more objective and also to be uh, a little bit more uh, ahead of planning when, for example, uh, games change and, and so forth. And the same principles uh, apply when, if we have the match day plus one uh, uh, off and we do recovery session on the day two. So this is the recovery uh, block. This is the pre-game uh, block. And this is then the conditioning block. And then we can see in both cases that when there's less than five days uh, to, to the next game, it gets kind of hard to get a, a new, uh, a normal conditioning session because the games get too tight. <clears throat> and you can also overview this on a, a different view. And this is six days between the game and uh, where you uh, see the games. Uh, in red, and then you see the conditioning session also in red on day four. And this is just another uh, view where, where we add a little bit more on the duration, the session RP, uh, expected loads, something about our prep actions and strength work that will uh, come up shortly, and then also some uh, of the sprints and tactical uh, things that will be present during the week. And also when we have the football conditioning and when and when not to do maybe crossing and finishing on, in isolation, um, depending on if uh, players maybe are extra sore after uh, a conditioning day, it might not be the best thing to, to do there um, on that uh, day, for example. <clears throat> so we'll get back to that. Uh, in terms of our team periodization, we also have to take in external factors, which is maybe the Europa League, um, where we can have three uh, recovery days versus two recovery days, depending on when, when the games are. And <clears throat> this is one example where we played uh, Braga away the 3rd uh, of August, and then three days later we played uh, a domestic game, and we had to decide who are we going to rotate uh, in, and then who are we going to rotate uh, out. Uh, from these two, two games. 
Uh, this is a special external factor because the, the away game in the Europa League went to overtime, 120 minutes. So then we need some sort of assessment of who are ready to play next game. <clears throat> the week will have a different structure uh, and you will see that the game is now replacing the conditioning session and the other sessions will be recovery or tactical sessions. So <clears throat> again, zooming out, uh, so manage player load, the external work, uh, external load and the internal load, the reaction on, on the work, the well-being of the players, and then as connecting uh, the whole uh, loop uh, with, between us with internal communication. So the daily schedule, <coughs> we try to uh, meet in the morning and then the players do their self-assessment, which gives us the input of where they, do they stand right now when they come to us. They do a prehab and the treatment after the breakfast, we have a meeting, a training info, and a video presentation. There is also time for a pre-activation after the meeting, and then the training on the pitch uh, starts, which is starting with a prep or a warm-up, which can be 15 minutes, so it can be up to 30 minutes. Uh, after that, it's lunch. If there's a double session, um, it starts uh, later on in the afternoon, which can be strength, yoga, or some extra training, uh, so forth and there's a recovery meal provided. So these strategies will then be connected to every training, so the pre-ab and the pre-activation. Uh, we will have uh, different tailored to different uh, players, and the and most important is that uh, they use their time well, and that the, my, body is my, uh, my, uh, my body is my tool as a mindset. They have different programs, and it's all about microdosing exercises based on previous injuries and mobility and stability uh, issues. On the prep side, uh, you can find a lot more on EXO's uh, Formula Athletes Performance, uh, where there's a very good structure of activation, dynamic mobility, movement, integration, and the footwork, uh, and the jump line and sprint, also called movement skills. Uh, which enables and goes very well aligned with um, warm-up strategies and preparing the, uh, the players for uh, the demands of the football actions and to integrate it with football and the phases of uh, the, uh, the game and also the objectives for, for the training. <clears throat> so when we come to the overload phase, uh, for summarizing, we will have uh, the different games in this uh, two days acquisition phase, uh, so the different games depending on the sizes uh, and the progression with the number of players, uh, variation of, of pitch sizes as is shown, work rest ratios and the number of intervals, repetitions and sets. Uh, the importance is to use the gradual build up so that we progress gradually and moving the players uh, so that, that we withstand more and more um, of, of the work that's done. If we have any players that is currently injured, you can use the either temporary, if it's a short-term injury, or it's a more structural uh, periodization or, or reduction, um, if it's a long-term injury um, and the players on the way back. So the individual periodization, as I said, the self-assessment, we value that uh, a lot. It doesn't cost uh, the player a lot of time. It costs them maybe two times uh, 20 seconds on their phone and then it's our job to connect with them and then also uh, speak and, and listen a little bit if they are reporting something for example as you can say here and there's a neat study from uh, Robin Thorpe that they did in Manchester United which really highlights the, the importance of asking the players of how you feel and we use a phone but you can also use any different uh, types to assess their well-being. One example of this is Rasmus, uh, who played a game. So this is an away game where he made, uh, you can see the tracking data, he made a record sprint and, and the high-speed work, which we talked about was the most demanding. And then he uh, <coughs> reported the days after, uh, the Tuesday, uh, on the recovery session, we expected him to be sore, but on the third day, we expected him to be back. And his, his own words were, it's strange. 
I'm still sore from the game and I feel like I haven't recovered like I used to. Then it's our job to be within the coaching staff to the team load was this, uh, as you see on the bottom. And then we have to periodize him individually um, and in order for him to make the extra recovery um, for, for the game. And then the player was able to recover and uh, perform again. Lastly, I will just uh, add this very quickly because uh, we're a little bit short of time. So I will uh, <coughs> say something about the recovery strength and the strength work where we uh, are the main objective is to train muscle. Uh, if, if we train muscles, we'll miss movements. But if we train movements, we will train all muscles, which uh, there's a nice, neat study that the reality of football, you need to be inventing time efficient training strategies for strength. Uh, which can be found in these uh, different uh, movements. Uh, so something that's uh, explosive for the whole body, individual stability, mobility, and then the lower body press pull, uh, upper body uh, press pull, and then the anti-rotation extension and lateral flexion work. So this is uh, just demonstrating the unilateral um, exercises, one leg, one arm, which uh, the players uh, neatly can tie into to the work uh, and the game. Keeping it simple, uh, using the research available, uh, microdosing, and using using the prep actions that we can have. So showing that uh, it's the research that we can use and and it's out there for us to to incorporate. <clears throat> So summing up, the recovery strength, which is done the match day plus one or two. Uh, again, uh, if we schedule some of the strength work there, uh, we can have the benefit of building the tolerance uh, later on in the week, uh, which is a nice study of uh, Lowell that shows match day plus three or, or pl uh, plus one uh, as a strength work uh, and injury prevention work. Later in the week, we can go more explosive and foundation for explosive movements where we can have uh, a more normal strength session with all those movements that I just uh, told you about. The power block, uh, the whole body explosive, where uh, the study from, from uh, France showed you the benefit of clusters using uh, those as a reg uh, regimen. I won't go into all these exercises. That This is just an example of uh, you, what you can use uh, for the players. Combining lower body push and upper body pull and lower body pull and upper body push uh, and then the anti-rotation extension and lateral flexion work. Building strength progressions from the academy to the first team is a good strategy to keep players on the loop and then giving that, them a head start into their, uh, their way of Com uh, competing in the first team level. Uh, the influences and the credits, uh, there's uh, a lot more uh, that I uh, probably forgotten, but you can find these uh, and uh, you will have uh, a good opportunity to look at those ones. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. It was very clear, very precise and very field-based for all the strength and conditioning coach that are uh, listening and watching right now.